Next, from Springfield, we talked to Representative Fred Crespo about why he supports tacking on an additional $1.4 billion in spending to a recently passed Senate bill which appropriated $4.8 billion in federal funds. This runs about 20 minutes. Representative Fred Crespo, thanks for joining us. We were just listening to a long discussion on uh, an effort to get federal funds that come into the state uh, to, to pass a bill that would allow those monies to go to fund various programs that get federal dollars. One of the questions that I had that I, I don't believe was asked was, and, and the issue I should say for those who may not have heard the, the long discussion, um, <clears throat> the bill uh, passed out of the Senate already, uh, it was $4.8 billion to allocate this federal spending. Uh, the House version that you were debating was going to add, was it 585 uh, million, some amount of, how much in GRF? In GRF, it's around $584 million in GRF. 584 million. What I did not know is that some of these federal funds do, do require a state matching. Right. Do you know, I never heard this asked, how much of that $584 million is required in federal matching funds? Not the entire amount. Uh, obviously, we had some, and I don't have the exact number right now, that in order to get those federal funds, we had to commit general revenue funds. But we also identified some time-sensitive funds that were needed uh, from uh, other state funds, for example, for the LIHE program. Uh, these are funds that are used to help folks who can't pay for their utility bill or to get their services restored. Uh, we heard through testimony from some LIHEAP folks that right now, even if they were to get the entire funding for LIHEAP, they're going to be delayed two or three months in processing some of those applications. What does that mean? That come December and January, in the state of Illinois, we're going to have folks that need the help to get their, get their services restored for heating purposes, and they're going to have to wait. So there's some critical services and some time-sensitive issues, too, that we felt we needed to include in this bill. You know, and here's something interesting, and I, I will first say uh, the, the individual that runs the LIHE program is an Illinois Channel board member, so I'll put that out there. But uh, because of that, I also know a little bit more about LIHE. One of the interesting things on LIHE is that those funds come from utility companies, regulated utility companies putting so much money in, it's not actually tax dollars per se, it's contributions from utilities. No, 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 a actually there's two components to the LIHE program. There's some federal dollars that we get fr from the feds and there's the state portion. The state portion is funded through a, a surcharge imposed on utility uh, bills. So when you pass, you pay your gas bill, your electric bill, you're paying this surcharge which is intended for the purposes of LIHE for the state-funded program. And you can't use that for anything else. So what we've included here is that piece there as, as well. So, yeah, we do get that from utility companies, but they collect it from their uh, rate payers, folks who use the services, and, and that's how they collect the LIHE funds. And the governor's been insisting on, on holding that up, and we've been telling him that you really can't because you can't use that for anything else. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, I believe he's talking about eliminating the uh, state portion of LIHE but by doing that, you're, you're essentially eliminating the surcharge as well. So uh, I'm not sure if he thinks that he can eliminate the portion where you use the money to turn the service on or, pay, or help people pay utility bills, but keep the surcharge on the utility bills. It just doesn't make any sense. <clears throat> and again, I don't want to spend the whole time about LIHEAP, but on the LIHEAP program, I believe, and this might be representative of perhaps some of the other kind of programs as well, two-thirds of their money actually comes from the feds right. and a, a third from the state. So here we are talking about trying to get those federal dollars, not only to LIHEAP, but a bunch of other programs. Mm -hmm. Do we know how many different programs approximately would get some funds uh, if the federal dollars were to go through? We had a list, uh, I can tell you right now, for the F Federal Home Fund, we had for the Illinois Community College Board, they would get some funding as well that we've included here. Uh, the ICCB, as I mentioned, IEMA, Homeland Emergency Preparedness is a big one as well. They testified yesterday that holding up those funds could actually uh, curtail their ability to deal with the disaster in the state of Illinois. And we had a State Board of Education that had uh, increased federal funds coming through as well. So we included those in, in this portion of the bill. Representative Davids Meyer was making the point 
walking through, which is really kind of civics 101. A bill has to pass both houses mm -hmm. of the legislature or both houses of Congress in the same form uh, before it can go on to be signed into law. Uh, the Senate passed it without the GRF funds. Right. What was passed out of the committee today has GRF funds. What would you say to those who are listening and going, well, wait a minute, why not, as Representative Davidsmeyer was saying, why not pass a $4.8 billion, which is the preponderance of the money? What is your answer to what Dave, Representative Davidsmeyer was saying? Pass it clean, and relative to the GRF funds, it could just be a, a separate bill that could be voted separately, and the governor was, was saying that he would sign the $4.8 billion, but he won't sign it with the additional GRF money. And, and their biggest argument was the fact that by adding some GRF, and keep in mind, the, it was going to be delayed no matter what. We had to include the IEMA money there for uh, the emergency preparedness, so that was going to delay it anyway. But we included here, just to let you know what the uh, uh, general revenue fund dollars were for, LIHEAP, as we just discussed, we had breast and cervical cancer screenings, Early intervention, and it's a program to help uh, families who have small kids with a disability to help them get back into schools and just help them. Uh, Meals on Wheels for seniors. Uh, we have seniors that rely on this, have no other way to get their, their meals, and we have child care money as well. So what we're looking at is this is an opportunity to not deny services to these folks based on how critical and how time sensitive some of these things are, which to us made a lot of sense. We need to... Uh, we can't go back to these folks and tell them you're out of luck because there's a delay here. Some of those programs may not need a match, and I guess some may need a match. Right. So who knows? Uh, have you had any conversation with the governor's office to say, what if we had GRF but just the amount that's needed as a state match? No, you know, it's been very difficult to have a conversation on the budget with the governor's administration. Uh, he's tying any budget discussion to his turnaround agenda. Uh, and if we don't include that, they just want to talk about the budget. And we've said many, many times before that there is a time and place to talk about the turnaround agenda. He's going to be in office for another three and a half years, uh, and there's some things there that we probably could, can work with them, but it has nothing to do with this fiscal year's budget. So it's been very difficult to just engage in the conversation on the budget alone, and that's why we are where we are today. Well, and you're one of the key people in the budget process. Just to elaborate, so even yourself, is it hard to sit down? If you try to have a conversation with someone in the administration, can you can you get in there? Can you have a conversation with them? I'm pretty sure the door is always open. I, you know, we've known Tim Newton for a while, and he understands the process. He came from the Senate as well. Uh, I think my concern, uh, just based on observation, and, and we've had meetings with Tim Newton, Donna Arduin, and a couple of the other folks in the administration, is that you, you bring people from the outside, Terry. They, they, they have an opinion on how to run government, and they might have some experience in other states. Every state is completely different. So I'm concerned that they're listening too much to the consultants that are coming from out of state that really don't understand the landscape very well and don't have the ties to the people that we represent. So I, I think that's a huge driver in, in their budget proposals or agenda. And we've had conversations. We spent close to two, almost six or seven weeks talking about budget issues prior to, to May, uh, but that led nowhere. If you don't mind, just a couple more questions. Something I'm confused on, it, it, we're, we're talking about how we're here without a budget, and I suppose technically that's true, but it's somewhat of a misnomer in practical terms because something like 70% of what would be in the budget is being spent anyway. Right. So it's, it's not like we don't have any money going out. We are spending 70% or so of more or less what we would spend in a budget, and, and no one even knows what the top line would be. That's kind of what the debate's about. Right, and it's a very dynamic number. We've had it's somewhat unusual, and you're right. So although we haven't passed the budget, they're, they're, we are spending money at a tune of close to 70% either through continuing appropriations, so we need to pay our debt service, we need to pay our pensions, so whether we have a budget or not, that's gonna happen. Uh, we've had some consent decrees that we are obligated uh, to meet those consent decrees that came from the federal government. We've had some court orders just in the last couple of weeks 
uh, instructing us and telling us we have to pay for well, uh, Medicaid services and things like that. So it's a little bit unorthodox how it's, it's, it's going on right now. It's, it's not the preferred method because uh, we, we lose control. But again, until we we're able to sit down with the governor's office and, and have a, a, a good discussion on budget bills only, and we, then we need to reconcile the fact that, number one, when he introduced his budget bill that started the whole budget process, it was out of balance by over $3 billion. So from, from the get-go, the process has been flawed. We did our part, and we always agreed that, hey, we, th this requires more, requires more revenue. So we never pretended there was a balanced budget, but we identified our needs. And I'm glad we did, because the governor was able to have a bill for education, K through 12, that he can sign to make sure the schools would open on time. So something productive came out of that process. And when he got the bill, he had also options. He could have vetoed the whole thing. He could have signed a bill like he did, or used a mandatory veto, and just strike some of the things that he did not want. Uh, so that's the way it's supposed to work. And he's making the assumption, and I mentioned this today in committee, saying that, fine, if you Democrats want a tax increase, this is what I want. But that's a flawed assumption, because for him to say that all the Democrats want a tax increase is not correct. We have members in our caucus who probably won't vote for a tax increase. So for him to say that he's going to help us with a tax increase, the tax increase is not for us. It's for the people that we represent, that he represents, and the Republicans represent. So it's, he's not doing us a favor by saying that he would support a tax increase for us. It's not for us. It's for the folks that we serve and we represent. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> I was going to say, uh, right now, what would, what would what would you say is the top line, or at least what was the uh, the budget that was passed in May uh, that the governor vetoed? Was, what was the top line as far as spending on that? It was over $32 billion, which seems to be the rule of thumb that we hear. 32, from, or 32 was it? Bill, it was a little bit over $32 billion. Okay, I, I thought it was even higher than that, but I didn't know that. It's more than $32 billion. I can't remember if it was 33 or $34 billion, Terry. But it was definitely, and we, we admitted that this is more than what we have right now. We need to sit down and see where else we can cut or talk about some additional revenue, uh, and we still need to have that conversation. I think there's still some areas that we can cut some more. And I would remind the people, so we, uh, the governor is saying your budget pass uh, is $4 billion out of whack. I would and tell the- his, 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 his introduced budget is over $3 billion out of whack. Because he was, he was presenting a budget that counted pension savings that really were fictitious. They, you weren't gonna have, uh, you may eventually have pension savings, or you may not, but you weren't going to have them this year. Um, and I would point out, when we passed the pension reform bill a couple of years ago, uh, had we done the same thing that he did, we, we would have just cashed in on that pension reform bill. We did not. We did not include that in our assumptions because we knew it was going to go through the whole court, whole, whole court system. Well, and I was going to say, the, the $4 billion out of balance that he's pointing out in the Democratic bill that passed in May, uh, I'll remind the people that the state income tax went off halfway through the yeah. fiscal year, uh, and that's costing the state, uh, it, it's always a little bit of a nebulous number, but in the ballpark of about $4.5 billion. In the ballpark, that's about right. So we, if we had those same revenues, mm -hmm. we would have been on a balanced budget because you because you lost the $4.5 billion. Well, he, he, when he was elected, he did request that we did not uh, extend uh, the uh, income tax increase, and uh, you know, we did not. We did not. We were hoping that he had a plan to deal with that, and we're still waiting. And the governor has said, of course, he's wanting to get his. He wants to hold the Democratic feet to the fire and say, "I'll agree with the maybe to add whatever his revenues. I don't know what his plan is for revenue and growth or revenue enhancement as far as adding new taxes, but he has said he might support some new revenue uh, if he can get some of his agenda items." He, he's, you know, it seems like uh, when you talk to him, you talk to Republicans and Democrats, I think we're all saying the same thing, that we need to look at other revenues, whether it's an income tax, a sales tax, progressive tax, I'm not sure, but it seems like everybody's saying the same thing. The problem that we have, obviously, I, I go back to that turnaround agenda. He spent the entire probably first three or four months of the year going around the state, talking to different towns, small and big, asking, asking them to pass a non-binding resolution non-binding, that yes, indicating that that town or municipality would, su would support the turnaround agenda. I can tell you, Terry, I represent 
I probably represent all or parts of six towns in the northwest suburbs of Chicago, all run by Republican mayors. And not one single one of my towns passed that resolution. At that point, you would think that they were taking a step back and figure, wait a second, this is just a non-binding resolution. I'm having a very difficult time selling that. So I, I think that's very telling. And I would hope that based on that, he realized that if he's having a difficult time with a non-binding resolution, you can imagine what you're going to face in the General Assembly, not only with Democrats, but Republicans as well who have some opposition to some of the items there. And I repeat, that's going to take a while. He's going to be in office for an additional three and a half years, and I think we should have that discussion. We're not saying we don't want to talk about the turnaround agenda. What we're saying is it has no part with this fiscal year's budget, and that's causing a lot of pain and a lot of hurt for a lot of people. I would tell the viewers, I mean, you're not viewed. You're a Democrat. It's, you're not viewed as one of the more liberal members of the Democratic right. caucus. Uh, and I would say a lot of the Republicans have a lot of respect for you and enjoy working with you. So, I mean, it's not like you're at extreme uh, odds with your Republican colleagues. Uh, but on uh, that said, how do you characterize the governor's proposals? How would you say, is he off base? Do you think he's politically naive? Uh, how, uh, so, that we're stuck on this, uh, these items that he says he has to have as far as his reforms. Just an observation. It's not a criticism. Okay, has was well, today's August 11th, around close to 3:42. As of today, I have an opinion, and it could be one of three things. One, as you pointed out, that there's still a learning curve, and they're still learning the process, the legislative process, and the budget process. Two, they simply don't care, or three, they do understand, and they're doing it on purpose to hurt people. As of today, 3.43, I'm giving the governor's administration the benefit of the doubt, and I think it's a learning curve issue, and they still have to understand how the legislative process and the budget process works. All right, Fred Crespo. Hey, one last thing. You came up with an interesting line, 50 shades of no. Where'd that come from? Well, you know, as we were sitting here during committee, um, it's funny because since we've been here this session, the Republicans have been voting collectively, all each and every single one of them, either... A no, or they're voting present. So it just popped to my head that, you know, I, I termed that practicing 50 shades of no, where the present yellow button is the darkest shade of no. All right, Fred Crespo, thanks so much. Thank you, Terry.